So what's up everyone, this is Darren Rose Studios, and today I'm going to be disassembling my uh, Amoeba Dual Septic Gear Precock. This is based on a Amoeba AM014. You don't have to choose this rifle, you can basically choose anything that you want. Uh, I chose this mostly because it looks like a honey badger. I quite like the ergonomics of it, and to me, in my hands, uh, it feels fairly short. It's because you can tuck it into your body, uh, it feels like a short carbine. So that's the reason why I like it. Um, but I'm actually not running the full inner barrel length. That's the reason why I can still build a DSG in this is because with a DSG You can't use a super long inner barrel. So keep that in mind later on when I disassemble this I will explain uh, All the details as to why you can't use this why you can't use that so on and so forth uh, It's because a lot of people like to ask me questions like that But for now, this is how it shoots. So in my gameplay footage you guys have seen what the trigger is like so basically Right? You, you, you get the idea. And on full auto, I'm not entirely sure what the rate of fire is. The rate of fire is not super fast. Yeah. I don't know how fast that is, but it's not... Um, I know what 50 rounds per second sounds like. It's not 50 rounds per second. It's probably close closer to uh, 40 rounds per second. And this is the battery I'm using. I am using... Uh, you can't see the label, but this is an 11.1. .1. You can see it right there, 11.1. .1. And this is, sorry, this is how I label my batteries. This is a 25C uh, battery, 1800 milliamp. So this is a, not, not a super big battery, but it is big considering that this is an amoeba. Uh, in case if you guys don't know why this is considered a, a fairly big battery for this, is because... In the amoeba, uh, it doesn't actually fit this battery, unless if you buy an extension. Uh, this happens to be, and uh, some I forgot the company name, something Airsoft Artisan uh, battery extension for the amoeba AM014. You can also buy the Airtex Studios. Uh, I also have that here, but I'm just using this just because I don't need that much extra space. I just need a little bit of extra space for the cable management. So that's why this is here. Okay, now we'll start disassembling the rifle. So all I did was that I took off the battery compartment and the stock. Uh, make sure you set this aside because this stuff is rather big. It might just get in your way of stuff. So uh, pop the upper off to make the gun a little bit smaller so it's easier for you to work on your desk. Uh, normally for your amoeba, uh, your uh, dummy bolt release will sort of get in the way. Notice how I grinded mine off and the reason why is so that I can just do this. So I could just slip the upper off really easily. And uh, this right here. Now, uh, notice that for my AM014, notice that the length of the inner barrel does not match the overall length of the gun, right? Uh, and a lot of you guys already know this. Uh, the reason why is because I have a tracer unit in this. That's the reason why my my rifle has tracer round. Uh, why the tracer rounds illuminate? Right. This is the uh, Ace Tech AT2000 tracer module. Uh, this thing is very very nice all you have to do is just put some masking tape and it will fit in very easily and uh, that's basically how the uh, how it goes into my gun uh, it's it's a very simple idea really uh, I chose the amoeba specifically because it already comes with a suppressor so I don't have to spend extra money on a suppressor now for this particular setup uh, I'm using a uh, 210 millimeter Prometheus barrel. Uh, this has been custom cut and recrowned, and the reason why is because the length of the 231 was a little bit too long, so I had it uh, custom cut a little bit shorter. Sorry, I know the camera's out of focus. And uh, basically, uh, this Prometheus barrel has a 6.01. Uh, this is a 6.01 type bore with a Japanese spark hop rubber and a tensioner. And I'll quickly disassemble this to show you guys. So the amoeba hop-up unit is a little bit different compared to your standard hop-up unit. And the reason why is because of this. So normally, your amoeba hop-up arm, it does not have a curve like this. Normally, uh, in an amoeba hop-up unit, your tensioner 
is your hop-up arm. There is no tensioner normally. Uh, this is the thing that normally pushes against your hop-up rubber, and Amoeba does not have that. So if you want to have a tensioner to enhance the hop-up, uh, you need to modify your hop-up arm and have a curve like this so that you can put your, your hop-up nub right over here. Right, and that's how you get extra hop up. So uh, the reason why I did this was because I really wanted to run a soft flat hop uh, to enhance the hop up. You will notice that this rubber is sort of deforming a little bit, which is a little bit unfortunate, but it still applies a, a very decent amount of hop. Um, this is the spark flat hop. It comes like that. It also comes with a soft or hard tensioner, depending on which one you buy. Uh, my friend picked it up from Japan for me, so. It's just something that I'm using. You don't have to use this. The hop-up unit is actually not that important because uh, because you can just use whatever you want over here. And uh, that's the hop-up unit and the upper. For your particular rifle, you will probably be using something different, so you don't have to worry too much about the upper. Now for the, now for the lower, we can start doing the uh, rest of the disassembly. Um, so first off, take off your stock. It will require an Allen key. Now, uh, in my particular case, I grinded off a little bit of my battery compartment over here so that there's a, a little bit of extra space for the uh, for the Dean's plug to come out. You will also notice that I used uh, colored heat shrink to label the, the red and black wire. Uh, it's because when I first cut it off, um, I also removed my motor connector so I couldn't remember which one was which. So I have these heat shrink on just so that I can remember. You don't have to do this. I only did this for my own convenience. Now let's disassemble the rest of the gun. So you will need. So uh, in my case, also I'm using a a different magazine release right, right over there. Uh, the reason why is because originally my magazine release, uh, my my amoeba one, it broke um, because I accidentally dropped the rifle. So um, I replaced it. And uh, this this hop up unit disassemble uh, this. Magazine release disassembles a little bit funny because it actually uses screws, so it's actually quite unique. I'm actually not a big fan of it because the ambidextrous uh, side doesn't really work all that well. It's also a little bit stiff to push, but uh, I guess that's secure. This is a China-made magazine release. I think it's called uh, made by a company called Big Dragon, which is a little bit funny. Now let's move on to the motor. I might want to re reposition the camera angle because the camera is too close to my face. And it's hard for me to maneuver around. So uh, these are plated. Uh, these are plated motor connectors. Is because the original connectors uh, broke. Because uh, I've had this rifle since May slash June 2015. Uh, this right here, uh, this is the stock Ares motor. Uh, I'll talk more about it later on. Uh, I know some of you guys are a little bit confused as to why I'm using a such a weak motor for a DSG. Uh, I'll explain all of that in a moment. When I have the gearbox open and everything. Oops, let me just position the screw back in. An amoeba uses four screws for the motor grip, if you're using the original one. Uh, I believe the Amoeba Pro Grips also use four screws, if I recall correctly. Uh, 
uh, there's one thing worth noting. Can you see my four screws are silver? Uh, these are stainless screws. Uh, I'm using them is because the original screws from the Amoeba, they all stripped ages ago. So I replaced all four of them. Now push your body pin and then push this pin. And then your, your gun should be able to come off. Oh, sorry, I forgot to take the spring. I'll just take the quick chain spring out now. You should have done this earlier, but I forgot to do it. So this is my uh, M125 spring from Super Shooter. It could be a PP Airsoft, I couldn't remember. I think they're just rebrands. So uh, this is your Amoeba gearbox. Uh, there's a plastic piece at the rear for here. Uh, take off your four screws here. Um, now one of my washers is stuck in my gearbox, so I'm just gonna leave that there. Now, now I'm gonna. Uh, this is something that only I do. I, I like to poke my gears down a little bit before I start moving the gearbox. And then I inch it up a little bit, and then I give it a good poke again. So everything inches off relatively easily. So this is the internals of my gearbox. Uh, let me just undo some of the key components first. So now let me quickly reposition the camera. So uh, because I need a little bit more room. Okay. So now we can start explaining all the parts. Uh, so before I start explaining what a DSG precock is, uh, you need to first understand what a DSG is and what short stroking is. So first of all. Uh, this gear in my hands, this right here, this is called an SSG gear or a single sector gear. And what this does is that it will pull this gear, it will pull your piston all the way back and then release it. And then your piston slams forward and then your gun fires. And it does this once per revolution. This is very, very slow. That's the reason why a lot of AGs, they sound sort of... Uh, uh, be, regardless of whether or not you're using a next gen, uh, next gen TM or an EBB or a uh, Amoeba or any other a AG, when they have this, it's really really slow. That's the reason why a lot of people like to do this. Uh, a lot of people like to grind off the pickup teeth of your sector gear, and what this basically does is that it it will only pull your piston back part way to let's say about here, and then it will release your piston and it will slam forward and then your gun fires. So this is much faster. The, the cycling speed uh, or the time it takes to complete one shot is faster. Uh, this is called short stroking. Uh, it's very common. Most of the time people do it here. You don't normally do it on the piston. You do it on a pickup teeth. Um, now, now that you know what an SSG gear is, uh, we can now talk about this. So this is a dual sector gear compared to... This. Right. this is the DSG, this is an SSG. Right. Notice how they're, they're very, very different. Uh, the SSG only has one sector or one row of teeth, while the DSG has two rows of teeth over here, like two sectors. I think that's why they call it dual sector. Um, and you will notice that it has only eight teeth per side. Most dual sector gears only come like that, uh, like Siege Tech and stuff, although Siege Tech does sell a special nine teeth DSG, which is a little bit special. Uh, because it will pull your piston back a little bit further, so you have more air. But in this case, uh, for this gear, it will only pull your piston back halfway, because there's only 8 teeth, and then it will release it, so it's much faster. 
but more importantly, it will do this twice per revolution. In other words, this thing can basically more or less double your rate of fire. That's the reason why dual sector gears are so popular, is because it, it, it increases your, your rate of fire, your semi-auto can theoretically be really really fast, and it just makes the whole system sound really snappy, which is what a lot of people like in AEGs. Uh, you don't necessarily have to use a DSG, but it's it's popular for... The, uh, you can obviously see why. is because everything is just uh, uh, enhanced, more or less, except for the power. Because when you short stroke, you lose power, since you're not compressing the spring all the way. But other than that, your rate of fire and your speed, everything is much faster. So now that you know what a dual sector gear is, uh, we can start explaining what pre-cocking is. Um, now, I, I thought about how to format this video. I think it's best that I explain all the parts first, and then I will explain how pre-cocking is achieved. Because uh, pre-cocking is, is one of the tricky parts of this build. Uh, I will leave that part for last. So I'll go over all the small parts first, and then I'll go over the trickiest part uh, at the end of the video. So uh, let's start with the DSG gear that I just talked about. So this right here, this is this is an SHS. This is an SHS dual sector gear. Um, these retail for 20 US dollars and they already come with a blue tappet plate. Uh, that's already modified. However, you also need to modify this a little bit more is because um, it's it doesn't uh, this this doesn't return fast enough. I'll explain why in a moment. So that's 20 US dollars. And now for the gear sets, you don't have to replace the spur gear or the bevel gear. You don't have to replace them, but I recommend you to replace them because the meshing matches this, the SHS gear a little bit better. Uh, but furthermore, uh, the reason why is because the bevel gear has more areas for the anti-reversal latch. Uh, this will make your pre-cocking a little bit more precise. Some bevel gears, they don't have much of, they don't have as much of these notches and therefore your pre-cocking doesn't always land very precisely. So um, in, in an ideal situation, you should get a bevel gear that has more of these notches. This one has six. And for the anti-reversal latch, uh, I'm still using the stock uh, Amoeba anti-reversal latch, which does not appear to be worn at all. You can just see that the tip over here has gone a little bit silverish, but otherwise this has been perfectly fine. Uh, this is also the stock uh, anti-reversal latch spring. Uh, I normally don't replace anti-reversal latches anyways, unless I, if I see it breaking. Um, I know the King Arms one sometimes breaks, but otherwise I don't replace them. Now, this SHS uh, spur gear and bevel gear, this gear set is an 18 to 1 ratio. Now, this is the part that will, that will surprise a lot of you guys. If this is a trigger response build, why? Uh, I know a lot of you guys are going to ask me, why am I using such a high ratio gear? Uh, shouldn't I be using a 13 to 1 gear, or a 12 to 1 gear, or even a 10 to 1 uh, Siege Tech DSG? The reason is, for me using this, 18 to 1, is much simpler than you think. Uh, as suggest does not make a low ratio DSG gear. That's the reason why. Uh, there, there's no such thing as a 13 to 1 DSG from SHS. So that's the reason why I'm sticking to 18 to 1. It's not by choice. Um, when you use these gear sets, your trigger response, yes, it will be a little bit slower. Your rate of fire will also be a little bit slower. Um, so in a perfect world, if you can afford something better, uh, go get it. However, that being said, um, this is 20 US dollars, this is 20 US dollars, so 40 US dollars total. Uh, the Siege Tech DSG gear set is 130 35 US dollars, which is significantly more expensive. Uh, if you are buying a Siege Tech uh, and you also ship it over to Hong Kong, in the end, the total will be about 150 US dollars or 160, I think, which is about, you know, it's basically almost three to four times more expensive than buying this. So, uh, budget is also somewhat of a concern. Also, if, if you're building an an Amoeba DSG, you're probably building this on a budget. I highly doubt you want to buy a set of Siege Techs for your Amoeba. Um, it's up to you, but I don't recommend it. Because uh, these these guns are sort of budget guns. They're not... If you want to put such kind of stuff in there, it's a little bit odd. But it's up to you. 
uh, whatever you want, because it's airsoft, and it's just do whatever you prefer. Uh, all I did was that I took him. Oops, sorry. Now, uh, next part we talk about is the trigger. So the trigger over here, uh, you will see that there is a pad right over there, where you're looking at right now. Okay, so this pad, what it basically does is that it shortens my trigger stroke, so my take up is removed. So all I have to do is just move my trigger a little bit, and then my trigger fires. Uh, another thing that I did was that I took a pair of pliers, and I bent the switch a little bit like that. I just held it and I bent it a little bit. And the reason for doing that is so that the switch will activate a little bit earlier. Okay, so that's how you make the trigger response uh, feel a little bit better. Um, however, you will notice that I don't have anything to stop the over travel. Um, and the reason why is because whenever you wear gloves, it's very hard for you to feel the trigger. So having a bit of over travel uh, helps me feel the trigger a little bit better. Uh, this is strictly a personal preference. If you want to build a hair trigger, then of course remove the take up and the over travel um, to whatever preference that you want. So ju just um, so that's the reason why you don't see me touching the over travel is because I need it for my trigger finger to feel something. Uh, and as a side note, you see this trigger return spring over here. Uh, you don't have to do this. Uh, I broke my original trigger spring, so that's the reason why I took a a, uh, a trigger return spring for a normal AEG and then I bent it to fit into the amoeba. You don't have to do this. Um, it's only because I broke my original one. So that's all that. Now for the piston and air seal. Now uh, for a DSG, uh, air seal is important, maybe a little bit more important than usual, and the reason why is because since you are not compressing the spring all the way, you will lose power. Uh, and therefore, any power or any air that you lose in the cylinder, uh, your, it will make your DSG seem really, really weak. So uh, the air seal in your cylinder parts need, are very, very important. Uh, you don't have to use the parts that I'm using, because obviously for your particular gun, you might be using different parts. The, the air seal, don't worry about what parts I use, just make sure, it's, just make sure it works properly. So this right here, the cylinder is a Sistema cylinder that's fully closed. And this is a PP Airsoft uh, damper cylinder head. And the reason why this is a damper cylinder head is because I'm using a damper piston, right? Um, so you need to use a damper cylinder head to match that. That's the reason why this is here. Uh, this right here oops, is my Sistema nozzle. Uh, this nozzle came with the set that comes like this. For 250 Hong Kong dollars, it comes with a nozzle, cylinder, and, and piston head, and uh, uh, and all that stuff. So that's the reason why I'm using that. It's just cheap. And the there's one washer over here to correct angle of engagement. Uh, you need to correct angle of engagement in your AEG uh, because uh, for your DSG. The reason why is because since this will double more or less double your rate of fire, you're going to be pulling a lot more rounds with this. So you need your angle of engagement to be fixed. Um, you need to you need to check up on that just to make sure that you don't wear it prematurely. Um, if you don't fix it, some your gear will will get damaged a little bit. Your uh, teeth over here might get damaged a little bit, so on and so forth, uh, because it just puts a little bit more stress on your gun. You should line up everything when you can. And uh, this right here, uh, this is a SHS uh, piston. Uh, I can't exactly remember how many tooth it originally came with. Let me see: one, two, three, four. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yeah, 14. Yeah, it's, a four, it's the 14-tooth piston. So it will, basically it has two cutouts over here. It makes the piston a little bit lighter. I also removed the extra teeth over here uh, to make it a little bit lighter. Now, the reason why you do this um, is mostly to save weight. Uh, for a DSG, since you're losing power, if your piston can move a little bit faster, it will help you... Out a little bit with the FPS. It's not the main thing that creates the FPS, but it helps a little bit. Every bit helps. Uh, in the future, uh, I do intend to drill some holes at the top over here, but for now, I just left it alone. Is because I didn't want to weaken the structure. Uh, in case of you guys, why I'm wondering about the structure is because um, 
I've never drilled holes on a piston that has a gaps over here. So I am a little bit worried. Uh, furthermore, another thing that I did was that I super glued my steel rack. Uh, this is very important. The reason why is because if you don't super glue it, the steel rack might come off your piston. Um, because uh, it's under a decent amount of stress. Uh, you also should add extra super glue to the bridge at the back over here. Can you see that there is uh, that steel? This, that's the steel rack, and this right here, this is called the bridge. Now this bridge here, it can crack. Uh, and to reinforce it, you basically add a lot of super glue into the gaps just to make sure that it's secure. Uh, this is not a perfect solution, but it's the solution that I'm using for now. Uh, in a perfect world, I would tell you to buy a better piston with a bigger bridge. Uh, some pistons have a significantly stronger bridge over here. Um, the, S the SHS pistons happens to have a, a fairly small bridge, so just keep that in mind. Now, another point is the power, uh, which is the tappet plate and the tappet plate spring. Uh, this is very important. This is probably one of the key things that a lot of people don't understand. So when it comes to a dual sector gear build, uh, you need to check up on a few smoothness parts. So besides the tappet plate, you also need to check up on the piston. So uh, first of all, when I talk about the smoothness of your parts, uh, basically what I mean is that, let's say if I close the gearbox and I'm moving your piston, you have to make sure that your piston can actually move on its own with your gearbox closed and the reason why is because if it does not move you will lose power or your piston might uh, encounter more resistance than usual which is not good that's the reason why you see me grind off this area over here because when I close the amoeba gearbox the SHS piston does not move that's the reason why I grinded that area uh, furthermore you also have to make sure that your tap plate can move smoothly when you close your gearbox, that it can move independently on its own. The reason why is because this controls uh, when your nozzle this controls when your nozzle returns. So anything that you do to slow it down, anything that you do to hinder this, what will happen is that if your nozzle does not return back fast enough, you will lose air uh, because your gun will try to fire when your nozzle is like here when in reality it should fire when it's here so anything that slows this or interferes this uh, interferes with this uh, it will cause power loss in your gun which brings me to the next important point So with a DSG, uh, you will notice that instead of one stub, it has two stubs over here to move the tap plate. And this area over here, uh, because it has two stubs and because your gears and because your piston only gets pulled back so far, you don't need your nozzle to be held all the way back. That's the reason why you trim the tap plate wing. That's the reason why this area over here. Oh, sorry. Oops. Sorry, I forgot my, my sector gears right now. But basically, uh, you trim the tap of plate wing over here. Uh, the reason why you trim it is so that it can return faster. It's the exact same reason as before. is to make sure that your nozzle can return back fast enough. So that's the reason why you trim this area. Uh, the big question that a lot of people ask me is, how do you know how much to trim this? Now, uh, I'm going to be entirely honest with you. Uh, I don't really have a straight answer for you. So, um, at least I don't have a straight answer that I'm confident in. So, this is what I normally do. If you sense that, if you, uh, if you chrono your gun, and if you sense that the power is exceptionally low, what I would do is that I would trim the tap of plate a little bit by little bit. Uh, because if your power is low, it could be because your nozzle is not returning fast, fast enough. If you trim this too much, uh, what will happen is that... Uh, your gun will not feed uh, because if your tap of plate is not being held back long enough, your nozzle does not go back far enough. So if it doesn't go back far enough, what will happen is that if you put if I put my chamber right over here, you will see that the nozzle is still protruding into the hole where the BB codes goes in, and therefore your BB will not load into the chamber. 
So, um, so that's how I determine. I just, I just test and look to see if if there is a feeding problem or if there is a power issue. And then base, and if I have a power issue, you trim it. If I have a feeding issue, I trim too much. That means I trimmed too, uh, too much of the tapa plate wing. That's how I figure that out. Uh, apparently, there's a different method for you to figure that out with. I don't know how. Uh, some some people have a special way to determine how far back this thing should go, or the or how much distance this thing should go. I don't really know. Is because when I spin my sector gear, and I and I see this move back, I don't know if that distance is enough. I, I can't tell. But uh. But uh, just keep in mind that in real life, apparently there's a different method that you can use to diagnose whether or not this is going back far enough or going back not fast enough, right? Not fast enough means you might lose power. If it's uh, if it's returning too fast, uh, you'll have feeding issues. So, so uh, just keep that in mind. And the next thing that you do is that you you uh, you use a stronger tappet plate spring. You can see. So this is an SHS tappet plate spring. You will notice that I bent out two of the coils. You're looking at it right now, and I just used a pair of pliers to do that. And this makes the tappet plate uh, spring stronger. Uh, that's the reason why I'm doing this. Uh, another thing to worth noting is that. Uh, Besides figuring out the problems that come with the tapa plate, another thing that you guys want to think about is uh, how much, how long is this distance? Like this distance between the top and the bottom here, uh, how do I know, uh, what number do I use, how do I determine how much to trim? There is no straight answer for this. Uh, I know a lot of you guys are, are really going to rage at the video because for not giving you guys a number. The reason why I can't give you the number is because it depends on your build. The faster your build is, the more you have to trim. The slower your build is, the less you have to trim. Now, I'm going to try to give you a number. You should not follow that number because that's the, not the number that you use. In my experience, 13 mm to 11 mm is roughly the range that you might need. In my particular case, I'm using a 10.96 mm for my tap plate wing from the top to the bottom. You you will not be using this number. You have to determine this number yourself because your build will be significantly different compared to mine. Your 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 spring might be different. Your motor might be different. Your gear ratio might be different. Uh, the resistance of all your parts might be different. Your movement of all your parts might be different. So therefore, no matter what number I tell you, you should not use it. Is because it depends. Yeah. So now that we got that all out of the way, uh, let's talk about uh, the the motor now. Uh, now that I can start talking about the motor, I can now talk about precock. So earlier in the video, I explained to you guys how a dual sector gear works. So a dual sector gear just pulls your piston back part way, releases it, and that's the reason why it's so much faster. Because the cycling time is faster, and it does this twice per revolution. What pre-cocking is, is that basically, instead of pulling your piston back after every shot, and then releasing it, pre-cocking will basically pull your piston back already to this level. It will pull your piston back to here already. And basically, the second I pull my trigger, the second I pull my trigger, the motor will spin a little bit, and my sector gear will move a little bit, and then my piston will get released, giving me that instant uh, firing feeling. So it makes your gun feel a lot faster. It, it makes the sound of the gun sound better. Uh, it makes it sound a lot more snappy. Um, and uh, this is mainly for semi-auto uh, for semi-auto fire. Just f sounds and feels a lot better. Um, and your your opponent will know. Your you will know. Uh, so on and so forth. So pre-cocking is a pretty nice thing. A, a lot of people like to do it for for AEGs because it just gives it makes your your single fire look like full auto, and uh, it just basically enhances the the advantages of an AEG. The advantage of an AEG is that you always have more firepower than someone who uses a gas pullback. That's that has always been true. No, no matter. Uh, no matter what the rules are used, is because you know that's the advantage of an AG. You can do whatever you want to speed up the gun, and uh, this is basically more or less, more or less, 
the ultimate way of doing it. Now, this is the part where I answer uh, all the questions as to how pre-cocking is actually done in the Amoeba EFCS unit. So, with the Amoeba uh, electronic firing control unit, it, it does not have the ability to do pre-cocking. It does not. This, does, this thing does not give you pre-cocking. You have to do pre-cocking by timing the cutoff with your parts. That's how you achieve pre-cocking here. Now, what parts do you need to balance? So the parts that you need to balance is your gear ratio, your motor, your spring, and the fourth and final thing is your battery. So these are the four things that you need to that you need to keep in mind with. Now, the gear ratio, uh, like I said, I'm using an SHS DSG gear. I don't have control over what ratio I use. It's because I can only use 18 to 1. So therefore, I don't have to think about gear ratio. I only have to think about spring, motor, and battery. Now, how this works is that a very simple way to explain this is that basically, you need one of these things to be strong and two of these things to be weak. In this case, I have a powerful battery, strong, a weak motor, and a weak spring. Now, uh, why does this particular combo allow me to land on precock? The reason is actually very simple. So if you, if I, let's say, if I have a strong battery and a strong motor, what will happen is that your system will overspin. Because the, the, if you're using a super uh, high torque motor, the spring is so soft, it's too easy to pull. So basically, this will overspin very easily, and your gun will not land on precock. That's the reason why you need a weak motor and a weak battery. Uh, sorry, a weak motor, weak spring, strong battery. That's the reason why. Uh, you, can also, you can also switch this around. You can have a strong spring, weak motor, weak battery. Although I don't recommend you to do that, it's because you're, you're, it might draw a lot of amps from your battery. If your battery cannot handle it, it will puff up. Um, another thing you can do is that you can use a strong motor, weak battery, weak spring. You can do that. Um, and the reason why you can do that is because you're, under, you're underpowering the motor with a weak battery. Uh, even though the high torque motor can pull a, easily pull a soft spring, um, ultimately it's being underpowered. So that's the reason why you can have a strong motor, weak spring, weak battery. Right? Uh, whatever combo you choose will depend on your build. For example, if you're building an outdoor build, you probably have to use an 11.1. Is because if you're using a very weak battery to pull a very hard spring for an outdoor power, uh, you will have a lot of problems because the, the motor will get hot, your battery get, will get hot, you will have a lot of heating issues. So, um, so, so basically, the answer here is that it depends on your build. Uh, it depends on what you're aiming for. As long as you have an idea of what you want to do, you will always have an idea about what parts you will need. Uh, I will also give you an other build example. So before in the past, uh, originally in all my Amoeba gameplay, uh, Amoeba DSG gameplay, I was using this. Uh, this is a 1100 milliamp 25C 7.4 LiPo. This is a very weak battery. And I was, what I was doing is that I was using a weak motor, this very same motor, but a strong spring. That's how I attained precock. So basically, um, this does not put out much power, but it puts out just enough power for me to precock a heavy spring with this setup. Right? So this is an example of what you can do. Now, um, the reason why I can now use an 11.1 is because now, you know, this is still a weak motor. Now this is a weak spring. So that's the reason why I can use a strong battery now. Uh, it's a very easy rule of thumb to follow. Just have one strong, two weak. Very easy, very simple. Uh, that's the first thing that you have to do. So step one is balance your system. That's step one. Okay. Step two, put magnets on your DSG gear. Right. So uh, this is the EFCS magnets. Uh, these two magnets, uh, you can buy these magnets from uh, Ares Amoeba. They're, they're very, very cheap. Uh, they come in a set of three. You can also buy your own magnets. However, uh, if you buy your own magnets, it's very hard for you to determine what the magne magnetic strength is. 
uh, is because unless if you have the tools, if the magnetic strength, if the field, uh, if the magnet strength from these magnets are too strong, uh, it will try to cut your gun off. Uh, before anything ha uh, before it reaches the sensor, so it's not suitable. So when you're buying your magnets, it's very important that you figure out uh, the size that fits in your sector gear and also the strength. So how I determined this was very simple. Besides buying the Aries magnets, you can also just just take your old Aries magnet and put this on top and just test the strength, right? Uh, you're, it, it is not a very scientific way to figure it out, to be quite honest with you. Now, the only reason why I do it is because I, I buy these magnets from China. They're very, very weak. Uh, they tend to be okay. And another thing that you can do is, so that's the first thing, uh, so that's the first thing you can do is the magnets. Uh, the second thing you need to figure out is the, is where you place your magnets. Um, yeah, specifically if your, if your, if your DSG can accept those. So, for this, you'll notice that this is a GNG DSG gear. Uh, there's holes already that I can put the that I can put the magnets in. However, for the SHS, you need to modify this area. You need to modify that area over here. You see how this 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 shape of this does not really match the shape of the magnet. You have to modify that area. So I took a Dremel tool and I widened it out to put the magnet in. Please, whatever you do, do not grind the magnets itself. It's because if you grind down the the magnet, you will weaken, uh, you will weaken it, so it might not cut off. So it won't it won't um, since it's weaker, the cutoff will be a little bit different. So please make sure that you do not grind the magnets. Just modify your sector gear, and to put the magnets in. Okay, this is very very important. Okay, so don't mess it up. Now, uh, so that's the second thing that you have to do. Now, the third thing that you have to do is uh, do your pre-cocking sensor check. So when you're doing that, what you basically have to do is that whenever you're assembling your DSG, uh, after you assemble it, you may notice that if your pre-cocking is not precise, it might be because the sensor is too far away from the magnet and it's not cutting off. So uh, if it's doing that, what you can do is that you can bend the sensor in a little bit. You can see that I bend my sensor a little bit down. So that's something that you can do if you're having uh, problems with the cut. Uh, and the fourth and final thing that you have to do is make sure that all your wiring and everything, make sure there's no way that this can short out. Now, uh, here's the reason why. Um, this might not sound very important at first, and there, there's a very good reason as to why I'm explaining this. When you use the EFCS, if it detects a problem, it will cut you off after about five shots. Okay? And the thing is, is that after it cuts you off, it's very hard to diagnose where the problem is coming from exactly. So, in my experience, if you wanted to diagnose problems on your Amoeba EFCS, you basically do a process of, el of elimination. Uh, basically, um, uh, hook it up to an amp meter, check out what the amps is, uh, check your wiring if anywhere is torn, uh, check the padding, the padding area for your Amoeba, uh, for your for your circuit board, uh, make sure that it's actually like not completely torn, or otherwise, um, you you might your PCB might be touching the gearbox, which is bad. Uh, you also have to make sure that your magnetic sensor, your sensor over here, is not hitting the gear. If it hits the gear, you will damage this, right? So that's bad. Uh, you also need to make sure that you don't damage these pins. Uh, you also have to make sure that the that your battery setting for your EFCS is for 11.1, not for a 7.4. If you have it set to a 7.4, um, oh sorry, uh, if you have it set to oh sorry, I, I reversed that. If you have it set for battery detection for 11.1 and you plug in a, uh, a 7.4 your your EFCS will cut you off is because it detects low voltage from this because you, you if you set up the LiPo protection for this uh, when you plug in this up to a certain point it will cut you off because it thinks it thinks your 11.1 is dying or, or running very low on voltage so it will try to cut you off uh, it might happen to you in the middle of a game or it might happen to you when you're building your gun 
so keep that in mind. Uh, you might need to buy the EFCS controller for you to program it. You, you might need to buy one. Uh, I actually have one is because I actually have four amoebas. Right. So so this is something that I've always needed. Um, and the uh, and the final thing that I have to say before I end the video is quite simple. So uh, a lot of you guys are always wondering like, uh, why on earth is this build? Oh, uh, why do so many people are so interested in building DSGs in an amoeba? Uh, why don't I buy a regular M4 with like a Gate Titan MOSFET, which I actually have one, or a BDC Spectre and build your DSG off of it? Uh, the reason is much simpler than you think. In fact, you've been looking at it this whole time. It's because of this. So. With most AEGs, you're using a cutoff lever, a physical cutoff le uh, lever that touches uh, that touches the bottom notch of your dual sector gear for the cutoff. However, the Amoeba EFCS it it has no uh, cutoff. It has no no physical cutoff. Uh, and what this basically means is that. Um, your the precision of your semi-auto, uh, it won't ever wear out. Is because since this is a magnetic, a magnetic sensor, it will never wear out. So your semi-auto will stay very precise at all times. Uh, it basically never wears out. Uh, it nothing unpredictable happens. That's the reason why. Uh, another reason, another obvious reason, of course, is because it uses a a a, a lever micro switch. So these kinds of micro switches are very nice. In fact, if I zoom in very carefully. Uh, and if I poke the sensor, you can actually hear the click, right? Uh, so a lot of people like this is because it sort of feels like an upgraded AEG already, sort of. Uh, however, uh, the stock performance of the gun, although not super fast, uh, this stuff sort of makes it feel a lot better. Uh, that's the reason why a lot of people are into it. And remember, these guns are quite cheap. Um, the total cost of this whole entire build was 290 Hong Kong dollars, excluding the battery, excluding the tracer unit, okay? which is actually not bad if you really think about it. Uh, and the reason why it's so cheap is because remember, uh, these Amoeba guns, they use a polymer receiver. They're really cheap. Uh, if you pick these up during a sale, you can buy them for as low as... Um, if you buy the really short guns, like the like the ones that look like a like an MP5, it can be like eight hundred to twelve hundred Hong Kong dollars. I actually forked out extra money for the AM014, which cost about fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred Hong Kong dollars. However, uh, remember how I said I picked mine up back in May uh, slash June twenty fifteen. Uh, back then, they were doing a special promotion to um, when it was first released. So I actually picked mine up for a thousand Hong Kong dollars. So that's the reason why I'm using these guns is because they're they're cheap. Uh, it's, I have it already, and I don't I don't mind using it. Right? You don't have to stick to this, but I recommend it is because it's. It, you can also buy the metal body guns by the way and build it off that. You can do that if you want. It's just uh, it's just my personal preference because I like the honey badger. And that's it for the video, guys. Um, that's basically all the important details. So I hope you found this video useful. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you guys think. Please feel free to comment, like, and subscribe. I also have a Facebook page and store in which there will be links in the description box below. And uh, thanks again for watching. Peace, guys. Happy shooting.